Well, hello. Uh, my name is Dobbin Chow. I'm the program director. And today you're visiting the University of Maryland Medical Center Midtown Campus Internal Medicine Residency Program. I hope that doesn't surprise you. I hope that that means that you're on the right link. And we're excited to to welcome you to our program. I, what I want to do is go over with you uh, some uh, so, some details about the curriculum, uh, about our hospital, about our about the the university um, uh, medical school and the relationship with the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Um, uh, I apologize; it's going to take a little bit of time. Hope that you'll have some patience. Uh, maybe you'll want to get a cup of coffee, uh, glass of wine, uh, whatever does the trick for you. Uh, put your feet up, and uh, we'll go through it. Um, and uh, and then when we do uh, get together, uh, you might want to jot down some notes or jot down some questions. I'd be glad to clarify um, and expand upon any areas that you um, uh, would like. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so this is a a map of Baltimore, and uh, this is where we're located. Uh, Baltimore is inside the uh, the yellow uh, dotted line. There's a beltway that goes around the city called the belt uh, called the beltway, uh, and um, it Baltimore is fairly accessible. Uh, 95 uh, is an interstate that goes north up to Philadelphia. Um, there's uh, 95 south that goes down to Washington D.C. Uh, 83 goes off to the northwest towards uh, Harrisburg. It looks like the downtown. We're at the confluence of these of these highways. It looks for all the world like uh, we're located right downtown, uh, but we're not. We're located in this region called Midtown, and so this is the highway 83 that goes off to the northwest, and uh, this is our hospital right here. Uh, and these blue dots are apartment buildings uh, where residents have lived in the past. Uh, they are. Uh, within walking distance of the hospital. Uh, and this area that all of these apartment buildings are congregated near is this neighborhood called um, called Mount Vernon. It's a popular area. Uh, there's um, uh, restaurants and, and shops in that area. Uh, this area is known for the arts. Uh, there's uh, the, 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 the uh, there's a Maryland Institute College for Art. It's a well-known art school. And it's located in this region, just north of our hospital. Um, there's uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore, which is a uh, uh, mostly is a, it's a uh, it's a commuter school, and that's located in this region. And there's a University of Maryland uh, Law School is also located in this area. So a lot of young people in the area, and. Uh, um, and, and 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 you feel it during the school year. It's it's pretty busy, and then when school is out, uh, it, this area becomes less uh, less less uh, congested. Now, um, uh, there's people who prefer to live out in the suburbs, and if you do live out in the suburbs, you can uh, easily commute to the hospital. <clears throat> Baltimore is one uh, subway line. It's called the Metro, and this is the Metro stop. It's called State Center. The metro starts in a northwest suburb called Owings Mills in the northwest, and the terminal station in the east is at right at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Uh, so people can commute to the hospital uh, by metro, or they can take a surface trolley called the light rail. It runs north-south. Uh, it's and this is the met this is the light rail stop uh, right here. I uh, don't know if you can see my. Uh, my 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 pointer, but at any rate, it's just uh, one block north of the hospital, and the light rail starts in a suburb called uh, Hunt Valley in the north, and the terminal station in the south is right in the airport. Uh, so um, the, the the hospital can be accessed um, by uh, public transportation, or folks can live uh, nearby. Now, the downtown is uh, dominated by this body of water called the Inner Harbor. We're about a mile and a half from the inner harbor, depending on where you you want to, you want to land in the inner harbor. Um, that it's um, there's there's a, a whoops there's a lot to do in the in the downtown area. This is the 
uh, the the um, the, the uh, aquarium. Uh, it's a it's a national aquarium. Uh, it's very popular. Um, and uh, there's the inner harbor, which is just to the just off the picture to the left of the aquarium. This is the harbor east area. It's the newer part of the harbor, and there's a lot of restaurants and um, uh, other activities that will that will uh, attract our residents uh, away from their their studies. Um, the um, now this area, as I mentioned, is of uh, Midtown is known for the arts. This is the Walters Art Art Museum, which is about three blocks away uh, from our hospital. This is the Meyerhoff Symphony Hall, which is just one block north of us. Uh, and it's a very nice uh, auditorium for music. This is the inside of the Meyerhof. Now, the, this region uh, has a, a art fair each year in, in the summer. It's supposed to be the largest art festival in the country. They close down all the streets around our hospital. It's a crazy weekend, um, but um, that's called Art Fest. It's um, a very popular event uh, here in Baltimore in the summertime. Uh, Micah's Maryland Institute College for Art, as as I mentioned, is the it's a well known art school, and we're right on the edge of its southern border. Um, and um, the Lyric Performing Arts Center is three blocks away from us, so a lot of activities related to the arts right uh, outside our doorstep. I try, however, to um, uh, and then this this area is called Mount Vernon. There's uh, restaurants here. This is the uh, the Peabody Library, which is pretty cool. It looks like something from uh, Harry Potter. Uh, don't, don't you agree? But this is the um, this is the, uh, the library uh, as part of the Johns Hopkins um, uh, Peabody uh, School of Music. Um, and this is the uh, this is this is the Washington Monument, uh, which is right in the middle of Mount Vernon. Um, I I, the, I understand they built another Washington Monument down in D.C. Uh, could be wrong. But this is the real Washington Monument. Uh, I, I, I try, however, to focus the resident evening activities on this venue. This is the School of Medicine Library. Um, it's it's open late. Uh, it, um, there's uh, plenty of seating. Um, it's not been an easy sell, uh, but our residents have access to a library, uh, and um, it's right by the downtown uh, medical center. Okay, so let me uh, uh, sort of walk you through the history of our hospital and how it came to be. Um, so this is this hospital was formerly called Maryland General Hospital, the original MGH, and we were f f uh, built in 1881, uh, and it was uh, it, it's it was it's a community hospital that serves this unique area of town. Uh, it's a diverse community. As I mentioned, there's people related to the arts who live in this community. Um, there's also um, uh, communities to the uh, west of us that are um, uh, uh, populations of patients who are uh, uh, have suffered from uh, social economic needs. And uh, we're proud and honored to serve those communities. So a very diverse community. And this hospital has been here all these years serving these communities. Um, now, and uh, in, in the 1980s uh, was a difficult time for hospitals uh, all over the country. Uh, why is that? That was because uh, during that time, the the, the CMS, um, this, which is the Met, which is the uh, organization that pays for patients with Medicare insurance, now they changed the paradigm for reimbursing hospitals. Up until the mid-1980s, uh, you, you were paid on a fee-for-service basis. You rendered care to a patient, you sent the bill to Medicare, they paid the bill, and that's how business was done. Then in, in the, around 1984, uh, Medicare changed to a DRG system. This is a system in which you were paid for a diagnosis. A patient was admitted to the hospital with heart failure, for example. You got a certain amount of money. And whether you kept the patient in the hospital for two days or kept in the hospital for 10 days, you only got that one allotment of money. And so this was a, a radical change in, in reimbursement paradigm. It was difficult uh, for hospitals to deal with. 
and uh, and and so a lot changed in the uh, hospital inpatient landscape all over the country. At the same time, uh, in the large cities, especially along the East Coast, uh, there was a sort of flight uh, to the suburbs. People were leaving the inner cities, moving out to the suburbs. Uh, growth of suburbs, and this was this happened uh, on all the cities along the East Coast, uh, Washington D.C. Uh, here in Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York City, uh, Boston. And so uh, so here in Baltimore, there was a suburb to the north, didn't have a hospital, and the, uh, and the board of directors of this hospital said, gee, let's move out there. We could do really well. Booming uh, a community, uh, tremendous growth, good payer mix. Yeah, let's move out there. So they purchased a 10-acre plot of land, They've drafted up architectural plans to build a brand new hospital. I've seen the plans that were so detailed. You can see where the light sockets were going to go in each of the rooms. And for the world, they were ready to move. But at the uh, at the last minute, the, the the mayor of the city came to the hospital. The the governor for the state of Maryland came, and they said, "What's going to happen to the patients who live in this community?" And so the board of directors realized we have deep roots here. We have a commitment to these communities. They decided to stay, and and so they did, and uh, and 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 it was a challenging time, as I mentioned, um, for 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 hospitals all over this country, and it was uh, for this one. And uh, what what happened over the that period of time is that hospitals merged and consolidated. Uh, it, it, it it happened. Um, in all the cities um, throughout the country, uh, and that happened here in Baltimore. So, for example, up at Philadelphia, uh, there was over 20 independent hospitals in Philadelphia in, in the 1980s, and then they all consolidated into three hospital systems, uh, the Penn system, the Jefferson system, the Temple Allegheny system, and and it's still evolving today. Same thing is happening in New York City, up in Boston, uh, the Mass General merged uh, with the Brigham. Now, up until that time, people from those two hospitals, they won't be caught dead in the same room. Now they're part of one uh, system, um, health partners up in Boston. So it's it's a uh, it, it was a it was a changing landscape. Now you may wonder, um, as an aside, why did they do that? Why did they create systems? It's because of HMOs. Uh, HMOs. Uh, uh, rule the day. Uh, this occurred during the Clinton administration. Now, President Clinton, when he came to office, uh, he tried to pass a health care reform bill. It didn't pass, uh, but uh, but um, part of his plan was to promote the growth of HMOs. Um, uh, in fact, you know who he put in place as the person in charge of his health care health health care bill. Uh, it was Hillary Clinton, uh, the so-called health care czar. Um, but uh, but uh, even though his plan did not pass, uh, he parts of his plan did, and this was the creation of HMOs. What HMOs did was they enrolled tens of thousands of patients into their plan. And then they would go to a, a hospital, and they would say, if a patient of ours gets admitted to your hospital, uh, here's what we're going to pay you. And the hospital will look at that, uh, um, and they would say, oh, uh, that that's not a good contract. Uh, we, we can't afford to do business with those kinds of rates. And the HMO will say, well, okay, well, fine. Uh, we'll go next door. And they'll go to the hospital next door, and that hospital next door will sign the, sign the, pl sign the contract. And so hospitals felt compelled to sign these adverse contracts, and so a lot of hospitals – Went in the red. They went. They they could not. Uh, their their reimbursement the reimbursement was so poor that they uh, uh, could not afford to stay in business. So hospitals merged and consolidated. So for example, um, if uh, up in uh, Philadelphia, uh, uh, the Penn system was such that they took all they took over all the hospitals in West Philadelphia. So then, if a plan went to Penn and said. Hey, uh, this is our um, reimbursement scale. This is what we're going to pay. And Penn said, "No, we're not going to sign that contract." 
Uh, that means that the patients who live in West, West Philadelphia, uh, they cannot go to any Penn Hospital, um, and so they won't be able to go to any hospital in their neighborhood. So, uh, so that won't work. So the 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 HMO was compelled to negotiate with these large hospital systems, and that's why these hospital systems became um, the they they ruled the day. And so, same thing happened here in Baltimore, and. Uh, this hospital became part of the University of Maryland medical system. All right, so let me tell you about University of Maryland. Uh, it, it was owned by the state, and they were built uh, to over 200 years ago. And uh, at the time, uh, the, uh, the state of Maryland built uh, a hospital to take care of the citizens of the state of Maryland. At the time, uh, people who lived in Maryland mostly lived around Baltimore, uh, and and in their wisdom, the state also built a medical school because they realized that they need to train doctors to work at this hospital to take care of the citizens of the state of Maryland. And so that became the the, the mission of the University of Maryland is to uh, provide uh, medical care to the citizens of the state. And so uh, the, the, the medical center began to acquire hospitals throughout the state uh, in strategic locations so that they could provide health health care to everyone who lived in the state. And uh, so now there's 13 hospitals in the system. And if you go uh, 40 minutes north on I-95 to on your way up to Philadelphia, uh, you'll run into Chesapeake Hospital, which is part of University of Maryland. Uh, if you go uh, uh, out, uh, south down by the airport, there's Baltimore, Washington, uh, Medical Center, which is part of University of Maryland. Um, it, in, in a suburb called Towson, which is north of Baltimore, there's St. Joseph's Hospital, which is part of University of Maryland. Uh, if you go three hours due east from here, uh, you'll fall in the ocean. But but if you go two and a half hours due east, you'll be on this area called Eastern Shore, and there's a uh, the Shore Regional Hospital out there, and that's part of University of Maryland. So, um, so and there's even there's even a hospital uh, that's uh, it's it's outside of Washington D.C. So it's in the state of Maryland, but it's 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 outside Washington D.C. It's called Capital Region Capital Region Medical Center. That's part of University of Maryland. Uh, so altogether, there's 13 hospitals located all over the state. And then you're gonna say, well, why do they want this hospital, small community hospital? less than one mile away from the University of Maryland Medical Center, the big house, the mothership. And the reason is because the medical center and the medical school are located in downtown Baltimore, and they've been in the same location all these 200 years. But like any hospital, like any medical school, they want to grow and expand. But it's difficulty doing so because of its downtown location. So I'll give you an example. So uh, shock trauma uh, it is it, 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 it started out as four beds in the ICU. It they wanted to expand it to become a sort of a hospital unto itself with its own ORs, its own ICU, um, its own wards, and and it and so they built a shock trauma hospital right next to the, the downtown medical center. But to do that, they had to demolish a city block and and build this beautiful. Uh, shop trauma medical center. The medical school also wanted to uh, build and expand. They um, purchased a city block north of the medical school. They dug a huge hole in the ground and they built this 27-story research center. It's 110 million dollars. A beautiful building, um, and um, it's a wonderful uh, research facility. Uh, just opened about five years ago. Um, but uh, but to, but to acquire land, build in the downtown location, very, very expensive. So when this facility became available, uh, the, the, the the University of Maryland uh, uh, jumped on it. Uh, and, uh, and then they began to offload clinical services up to this site. Uh, so um, endocrinology moved all its clinics up to the site. Pulmonary moved its clinics up to the site. Infectious diseases moved its clinics up to the site. Um, Pulmonary moved a pulmonary rehab unit uh, up here. It's a 22-bed rehab unit 
um, very in, uh, interesting uh, 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 unit that has, these are patients who are very, very sick. Most of them are ventilator dependent. They're going through a prolonged weaning process. Um, but that's uh, but that's here on this campus now. And so um, by offloading clinical services to this site, then the downtown site can continue to grow and expand. And, and so what's happened is that, that as these centers have moved up here to the Midtown campus, uh, the Midtown campus has become busier and larger. Um, then in 2015, the Midtown campus, the downtown campus formally merged and became one institution, two campuses, one board of directors, one CEO. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and this is, and since that time, this, this integration process uh, is, has now uh, evolved and um, matured. And meanwhile, at, at the Midtown campus, there's been an unprecedented uh, uh, growth. We now serve about 130,000 patients annually. That's both inpatient and outpatient. Uh, in 2010, they built a a, a new state-of-the-art operating uh, suite. Uh, the, the, sorry about that. Uh, the, the, the ORs at the downtown site are busy, congested, and so the surgeons from the downtown site, downtown site began to come up here and do their uh, outpatient surgeries uh, here at Midtown. Midtown ORs become busier and busier. And so uh, about uh, six years ago, seven years ago, they, they added a ninth OR um, room uh, and um, uh, to, 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 to the other ORs that they have. It costs over a million dollars to put in one OR. Must be the music system. Um, they renovated a 18 bed ICU. Now the ICU is staffed by by University of Maryland pulmonary clinical care faculty. Now there's about 56 pulmonary clinical care faculty at University of Maryland. Uh, so, and uh, what they could could have done is said, all right, everyone has to take a take a week of the year, come up to Midtown and 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 staff the ICU. Fortunately, they didn't do that. They they designated about a handful of pulmonary critical care faculty, and they're the ones who uh, are are the ones who run our ICU. Uh, they get to know our residents well. They they get to know our nurses well. They know the policy of the hospital, and and they become our pulmonary critical care faculty. Um, now they run our ICU just the way that they run, just like the, how they run the ICU at the downtown campus. Uh, there's a critical care fellow that's here with them, and uh, it's a very uh, well-received rotation. Uh, in fact, I think for the residents, some of them consider it a pinnacle rotation for them. Uh, they really enjoy working in the ICU here. Uh, the sleep lab was moved up here, <clears throat> and um, uh, the sleep center is, uh, is, is, is here as well uh, for patients who need consultation uh, with sleep disorders. Uh, as I mentioned, the pulmonary rehab unit is here. And then in 2018, they built a brand new inpatient psych unit here, 36-bed psych unit. It's a, it's a, it's a state-of-the-art uh, uh, facility uh, with all the latest features so that patients cannot, uh, uh, cannot harm themselves. Uh, people come from around the country to go to visit the unit to see uh, all the bells and whistles. Uh, and then in, in 2021, they we built a brand new 10-story ambulatory tower. And this is to house um, new clinics that have moved up here to Midtown from downtown, uh, cardiology clinic, uh, GI clinic, um, uh, nephrology clinic, uh, ophthalmology clinic is in there. Um, so it's it's a, a, a brand new facility and... Um, it's really terrific. The tenth floor, the top floor, is uh, primary care, and that's where the resident clinic is. And the in the primary care office helps coordinate the care of patients as they uh, rotate and 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 visit these various subspecialty clinics. Um, and and the, the interest is to create a 
chronic uh, care uh, delivery model uh, in which patients in our community can access uh, primary care and subspecialty care at the same facility um, and, um, uh, and, 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 and get their care in a coordinated way. Uh, so I think we've, we're well on the way to, to transforming into one academic medical center with two campuses. Uh, and so this is a picture of the uh, ambulatory uh, building. Um, uh, endocrine occupies one of the f uh, floors um, along with uh, nephrology. Um, there's uh, there's a um, um, there, there's more and more uh, faculty from the downtown who come up here uh, to practice because of the presence of this uh, new facility. And then the patients who are seen here, if they need to be hospitalized, then they'll end up being hospitalized uh, at our hospital. Uh, now, this is Mohan Santa. Uh, Mohan is, uh, he's, the, he's the CEO of the entire University of Maryland medical system, all 13 hospitals. Uh, he's a, a radiation oncologist by training. He's a great guy, uh, has... Uh, as a vis visionary approach to leadership. And uh, so he, he, he said that the integration of our two campuses uh, provides an important opportunity to be more efficient and provide the best care for patients. And we have prioritized the role that we play as an anchor institution in the West Baltimore community. And, and, and so uh, Midtown will provide a, it, it, it'll, it'll provide the, uh, the, the care to the community whereas the downtown site serves as a tertiary referral center for those patients in the state who require tertiary care. Uh, and so the focus at the downtown site is on intensive care, on tertiary care, on uh, care that um, is not available at the various community sites around the, around the state. Okay, so uh, what are our program goals and mission? Our goal is to allow each resident the opportunity to create and fulfill his or her own professional goals. Now, this is not taken lightly. And what does this imply? This implies that you, as a resident here, have insight into your own, uh, your own goals. Uh, you have insight into what you need to fulfill your goals, uh, what resources you, you would like to have access to, and it's our it's our job as a, as your program uh, to help you meet those goals to provide you with those resources. Uh, so um, it, it it requires a um, a a, um, a resident to have some uh, sense of their uh, own destiny uh, and um, and a and a passion in a direction uh, and. Uh, motivation uh, to uh, achieve those goals. Uh, the hospital is a clinical learning environment. Uh, we're a smaller hospital, um, and uh, y y you'll find that we have a unique uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, it's characterized by collegiality, uh, sense of engagement, uh, and a, a passion for scientific inquiry. That um, it's a supportive, nurturing environment. Um, it, and I know that it's easy to say, uh, but we 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 spend a great deal of effort trying to create that culture. Um, I think that's one of the strengths of the hospital, one of the strengths of the program. Uh, we our interest is that residents are interested in teaching and supporting each other. Um, no, uh, my my philosophy is that no matter what. Uh, residents do in their future career, uh, whether they practice uh, primary care, uh, subspecialty care, uh, whether they practice in a um, community setting, uh, practice at an academic medical center, that that they're be interested in teaching, that teaching be part of their core skills, uh, be part of their uh, professional interests. Uh, we try to nurture an interest in teaching. Um, and we want to be able, be able to provide high quality evidence based care in a compassionate and professional manner. Okay, so let me go through the uh, 
the, walk you through the, the faculty here, because I think that may be insightful to you to learn who who is the faculty. Okay, so Ellen Marciniak is the associate program director. Uh, she is a pulmonary and critical care uh, faculty member, uh, and uh, you'll um, you'll you'll see her up in the uh, ICU. Uh, she uh, is uh, involved in teaching uh, and running the ICU. Uh, Jeff Gerbino, he's an associate program director. He's a director of the uh, resident ambulatory uh, practice, uh, so he's direct. He's he, he's responsible for the ambulatory curriculum. Uh, Dr. Malik, uh, she's uh, an endocrinologist. She's the DIO. DIO is designated institutional official. Every uh, uh, teaching hospital has a DIO, and they have responsibility uh, for oversight of the institution to make sure the institution um, meets. Uh, meets the needs of the training programs housed by the institution. Um, now, who are the subspecialists uh, here? And uh, so Dr. Hawk is um, the director of cardiology. Uh, he's 100% here. Uh, he uh, does consults in the hospital. He also has um, uh, his practice is 100% in the ambulatory tower on the ninth floor. Um, Dr. Um, Vercellus, he's the Director of Pulmonary and Critical Care. Um, now, um, he's not 100% here, and that's because his research lab is located at the downtown site. Um, and so he spends time uh, at the downtown site um, uh, uh, where his research lab is. But he spends a lot of time up here. His clinic is located up here. Um, you now, there's a shuttle that goes back and forth between the two campuses. It runs every 15 minutes. And uh, he says that he and the shuttle bus driver are best friends. Now, Dr. Onder is the director of uh, nephrology. Um, she's 100% uh, uh, based uh, here. Uh, she uh, helps they, the consult service. Uh, they, they, they rotate a different attending on the nephrology consult service every week. But she seems to do it about every four weeks. Uh, otherwise, she's in the, uh, she's in the clinic. Uh, which is located on the eighth floor of the tower, and um, she and her colleagues are uh, wonderful, uh, uh, enthusiastic, uh, love to teach residents, and um, uh, very fortunate to have her. Uh, Dr. Kaura is director of HEMOC. Uh, now, um, her office is in the professional office building across the street from the hospital. Uh, she uh, d uh, did her residency uh, uh, here, then she did uh, HEMOC fellowship at the downtown campus, and uh, now she's in practice here. But she uh, knows all the poem, oh, she knows all the um, uh, HEMOC uh, faculty at the downtown campus. Uh, she organizes uh, a monthly oncology le lecture for our residents and uh, case conference, and uh, she also has a, uh, a rotation in her office uh, in oncology. Um, so she's a very important member of our faculty. Uh, Ray Kim is the director of GI. Uh, he has a very uh, scared look on his face. Uh, Ray is um, a interventional gastroenterologist. Uh, he tried to explain to me what that means, uh, and I'm not exactly sure what that means. But at any rate, uh, he, uh, he 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 rotates with a group of about six gastroenterologists. They cover the GI uh, consult service here one week at a time. Uh, Ray also does uh, procedures at the uh, downtown uh, campus, uh, but he's here a lot because he's also uh, director of the endoscopy unit here, and he does uh, a lot of procedures here. Also, his clinic is located uh, here in the uh, ninth floor of the tower, so he's on the campus a lot. Uh, uh, he's, 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 a, he's a great guy and a wonderful teacher. Uh, ID is uh, headed by uh, Pat Riscavage. Um, now, it's a big ID practice here. They occupy the entire seventh floor of the tower. Um, they, um, the, the ID is a center of excellence for the University of Maryland, a big uh, uh, research center in infectious diseases. Um, the Institute for H uh, Human Virology um, uh, has... Um, uh, has uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, grant funding, um, 
and uh, the ID faculty is very well known, uh, very active uh, clinically, uh, but also um, and also in terms of uh, uh, their 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 scholarship, uh, wonderful uh, research work. They also run eight different centers of, uh, for HIV treatment in, in Africa, and um, these are uh, spots. These are um, uh, grant funded. And uh, they've um, uh, th so for residents who are interested in infectious diseases who are interested in doing uh, a rotation in Africa during their senior year, uh, that opportunity uh, does exist uh, through the infectious disease division. Um, continuing on, Kasif uh, Munir is director of endocrinology. Um, uh, it's a busy endocrine uh, practice. Uh, they also are highly engaged in research um, and uh, very um, supportive of our residents. Uh, Dr. McDashie is uh, uh, head of uh, rheumatology. Uh, he is um, now, uh, he spends some of his time uh, here. He also spends some of his time at the downtown site. Uh, and, but and, and, but primarily at the VA. At the VA, he helps run the rheumatology fellow clinic, which is based at the VA. So he's uh, here about sixty percent of the time. Uh, Dr. Munier, uh, he's here on this campus um, about um, I'm going to guess about uh, sixty to seventy percent of the time. He spends some of his time at the downtown site helping with inpatient consults. But for the most part, he's here because the clinic is here. Uh, he also uh, helps out with the inpatient consults uh, here. Um, he's uh, uh, they, they have a busy uh, outpatient practice, as I uh, as I mentioned, and they also have a uh, very robust um, uh, research uh, component to their uh, division. Uh, geriatrics is based is based at the VA hospital. The VA is located across the street from the main hospital. Uh, Jake Blumenthal is the director of our geriatric rotation. All third-year residents uh, do a, a one-month rotation uh, with Jake at the uh, at the Baltimore VA. Um, and uh, Jake is a great teacher, and um, the uh, residents enjoy that rotation. Uh, emergency medicine is a required rotation in the first year. Uh, Dr. Alfra Ali is the director of the emergency medicine rotation. Um, it's uh, well received. It's well organized. You do different shifts um, throughout um, that uh, different parts of the day. Sometimes you do day shifts. Sometimes you day you do uh, evening shifts. Uh, and um, uh, let me just um, sorry about that. So, uh, sometimes you do evening shifts, and and um, and you'll get exposure to uh, uh, ultrasound. Um, uh, you also. There's a set of didactics that you uh, will go to every um, uh, Wednesday uh, morning, um, set of uh, didactic lectures uh, with the emergency medicine uh, residency program at the downtown site. Uh, palliative care is um, headed by Carla Alexander, and um, she also um, gives uh, lectures to our residents uh, in uh, palliative care. I don't know who these people are. Uh, uh, okay, so the call schedule. So we have three medicine war teams. Uh, on two of the teams, it's one resident, two interns, and then on one of the team, it's one resident, one intern. That latter service is called the intubated care unit. Uh, this that that team, those patients are sicker than those patients on the wards. They're not quite sick enough to require the ICU, but they're not, uh, they're a little bit too sick for the regular wards. So this is called the intubated care unit, and there's uh, one resident, one intern, seven patients on that unit. And on each of these three teams, there's one to two medical students each month. Now, there's a night float uh, team, and they're, they're here from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. There's one resident, one intern, one medical student on the night float. Now, in the evening, uh, these teams sign out at 4 p.m. to the long call team. So the three teams rotate being on long call. And then in addition uh, to those three teams, uh, there's a, 
um, a team that um, uh, there's a th th there's a team that the f that that that's, uh, that that floats in, so that you're on long call every fourth day. Um, okay, now so these are the three teams, uh, and uh, they accept admissions in a serial fashion. Except the, as I mentioned, the orange team is um, the IMC team. So you to, to qualify to be on that service, you have to be a little bit sicker than the regular wards. Uh, now here in the purple team, the gold team, they alternate admissions throughout the day. Uh, so you get admissions uh, every day. There's a cap of 16 patients on the purple and gold teams. Um, so that's an interesting story. So uh, there was a time when uh, we had a cap of 20. That's the ACGME limit. Uh, we, we had that cap. We never really reached that cap, and we but we kept it just because that's the ACGME limit. Never really got there. Uh, however, uh, COVID hit. Um, you all remember COVID. It's this disease that uh, happened, to, uh, maybe it happened elsewhere in the U.S., but happened here in Baltimore. And uh, so uh, all of a sudden, we got a lot of patients. And then we were at the cap of 20 uh, during the pandemic. And uh, so um, we thought uh, that was a lot. The residents noted that they could do the work, but it was a lot. And what they found was that they could do the work, they could take care of the patients, but it was difficult to attend to, make sure that they attended to their educational needs, that they, uh, that they, uh, make sure, uh, we want to make sure they have time and opportunity to to learn from the patients that they were assigned. Uh, so, uh, what uh, so what we did was then we cut back the cap from twenty to eighteen, and uh, and that was good. The residents thought that was good, and uh, but they said um, after about uh, six months, they said, "Gee, uh, they uh, there were days they were, they were they were busy and they had difficulty attending to." Uh, their educational needs uh, and prioritizing their education, which is what we want them to do. So now we, we cut it back to 16. And at 16, it seems to work. Uh, we, we, I think we've hit a sweet spot where they get a, enough volume of patients. Uh, they get a good exposure to pathology, uh, but not so much that they are overwhelmed, not so much that they uh, are not able to, 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 to make each patient encounter a meaningful educational experience. Now they're not at sixteen every day. Um, uh, you know, some days there are thirteen, some days uh, fourteen. But you know, we 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 hold uh, hold them to a cap of sixteen. Um, now on the orange team, as I mentioned, the cap is seven. Now the night float emits a a total a cap of uh, five patients overnight. And then in the morning, these five patients are transferred to day to the day teams at seven in the morning. All right, so you're going to wonder, um, hey, so we went from twenty a cap of twenty down to a cap of sixteen. Hey, that's that's nice, right? What happened to those four patients? And so there's two teams here, so it's actually eight patients. Oh, uh, we, we just you can't just leave eight patients unattended. Uh, un uh, you, you got to have someone to take care of them. Uh, so the hospital, um, uh, they, they, they bought into the need to cut down the cap, but the hospital also um, staffed a non-teaching hospital service to take these overflow patients. Uh, now, to, to stand up a hospital service, uh, you can't do that at the drop of a hat. It requires hiring uh, two hospitalists uh, and they work um, seven days on, seven days off. And so there's a cost associated uh, with hiring two hospitalists, and it's about uh, half a million dollars. Um, but the hospital saw this as an investment in terms of making sure the residents uh, meet their uh, their educational mandate. Okay. Now, um, as I mentioned, the three teams take turn being a long call throughout the month. And then the resident who's on rheumatology will finish rheumatology during the day, and then at 4 o'clock will come in and help provide cross-coverage. So that, that resident uh, provides the Q4 hour uh, uh, long-call coverage. 
Um, and uh, the teams uh, have either Saturday or Sunday off so that um, everyone has one day off a week. Uh, the ward interns are on long call every four days. There's a TY, a transitional year intern each month who works on the wards Monday through Sunday, and they help provide cross coverage. This transi transitional year intern has Monday and Tuesday off, so they essentially work five days a week, um, but they have Monday and Tuesday off, and they work uh, 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 Friday and and Sunday, and then they have <clears throat> they do um, um, uh, work on a QI project <clears throat> uh, uh, Tuesday. Uh, I'm sorry, Wednesday and Thursday. All right, so this is the schedule. Um, and uh, so at 7, 7 o'clock, you, know, you come in. If you're on the wards during the daytime, you get signed out from night float uh, from 7 to 7.30. You pre-round on your patients. And then from 9 to 10.45, you you have attending rounds. And then uh, from uh, uh, 12 to 1, there's noon conference uh, each day. <clears throat> And then uh, at from four to four thirty is sign out rounds in the evening, and as I mentioned, every fourth day you maybe end up being on long call. All right, the first is the, the PGY one schedule. Uh, so there's uh, four months on the wards, one month of night float, one and a half months of ICU. The ICU CCU is a combined unit here. One month of endocrinology, one month of emergency medicine, an ambulatory block, and then. Uh, two electives and a uh, um, and a uh, half month of uh, vacation. Um, the, now I'm, I'm showing you the uh, the transitional year schedule. We have ten transitional year interns. We have nine categorical and medicine interns. Uh, they do three and a half months on the wards, a month of emergency medicine, one month of general surgery, half month of night flow, two and a half months of ICU, well, one month of this cross coverage. As I mentioned, they work on the weekends. Uh, two months of elective and, and uh, two weeks of vacation. Uh, now, um, uh, I, the reason I show you this is because uh, this schedule is very uh, similar, but not exactly the same as the categorical uh, first year schedule. Um, what's uh, what, what's different is that um, the tr transitional years have a month of a general surgery. Uh, now, um, you know, in the past. That was they were busy on the general surgery wards, so it was similar to the general medicine wards. So instead of four and a half months of general medicine wards, they have three and a half months of general medicine wards, and then one month of general surgery. They have two and a half months of ICU, um, but only half a month of, of night float. And um, these the the ice, night float is 12, 12 hour shifts. ICU is twelve hour shifts. There's some overlap between these two um, because some of these ICU blocks are at night. Uh, so our interest is to be sure that the transitional year interns and the categorical internal medicine uh, interns, that their experiences, that their uh, curriculum, uh, that their expectations are very uh, similar uh, to the categorical interns. Um, and uh, we feel like the categorical interns and the trans transitional year interns, uh, they're all one confluent integrated group of interns. Uh, everyone is uh, working hard together. They're all in the same boat. Everyone's pulling with the same vigor. And uh, and, and we tr try not to differentiate between the two groups. And, and I think that makes a year go better. Uh, if you're uh, on the wards and you're uh, paired up with a transitional year intern, um, the the they have the exact same expectations um, uh, set out for them as 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 you do, and um, you know I and, and I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, if you are uh, working hard, you're pushing a boulder up the hill. If the person next to you is, is pushing with the same amount of vigor, uh, then that boulder gets up the hill more quickly. If you feel like uh, you're doing more work than they are, uh, it's not a very um, in a joyful experience, uh, and 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 so our interest is to create a a a, a, a environment in which everyone is together. Everyone um, uh, is feels like they're they're integrated. They're not two separate groups of interns. 
Uh, here's the PGY2 uh, uh, schedule, four months on the wards, a uh, two-week block that's a quality improvement, the QI block, two months of ICU, month of night float, one month of neurology. And this neurology um, uh, is based at the downtown medical center, one ambulatory block, two electives, and, and uh, two weeks of vacation. By the way, this is the ICU at uh, nighttime. Uh, this is the nighttime uh, attending. And, uh, and and look what they're doing. They're sitting around eating pizza. But now, I think the transition from first year to second year is a harder, more difficult transition than from medical student to intern. As a intern, you'll always have backup. You'll always have oversight. And it'll be close at hand. As a second year resident, uh, you are charged with uh, uh, running the service. Uh, you're given increased responsibility. You're also charged with uh, teaching and mentoring the in the interns and students on the service. Um, this is, um, I, I I know that this is um, a bit overwhelming for the in for the interns as they go into the second year at the beginning of the second year, uh, but they enjoy it. They they like that degree of autonomy. They like that degree of responsibility, um, uh, uh, but uh, it, it's it's challenging at the beginning of the of the second year. But they but but they make the transition from following orders uh, to the ones uh, giving orders, uh, creating the plan for their patients. Uh, this is the third year schedule: two months on the wards, two months of ICU, half month of my float. Geriatrics, as I mentioned, is based at the VA. Two ambulatory blocks. Uh, one uh, month of rheumatology, uh, two electives, and a um, month of cardiology. All right, now the cardiology um, is based at the downtown medical center. All right, why do we why do we do that? Uh, here at this hospital, uh, we don't have uh, interventional cardiology. We don't do bypass surgery. If you end up at our hospital and you have acute, acute coronary syndrome, uh, we uh, call an Uber for you. We send you to the downtown campus. No, we don't call it Uber. We send you to downtown campus, and there they will uh, angioplasty, a coronary artery. They'll stent it. They'll massage it, whatever they do. But um, those that population, those that pathology is not seen uh, here. So because we thought it would be good for our residents to have some exposure to interventional cardiology, um, they uh, we created this rotation where they're based at downtown campus. Uh, on the uh, and then they see a lot of a um, lot of uh, tertiary re referral cardiology patients with refractory heart failure, refractory arrhythmias, um, and, um, and and acute coronary syndrome. Um, so that's a uh, that's a rotation that's been added to our curriculum. All right, so let me uh, so the, here's our rotation schedule that's sort of mapped out in a grid here, and uh, I wanted to comment on uh, on some of these. So the ambulatory blocks. So what are these ambulatory blocks? Well, um, in the second year, it's a prime. So this ambulatory block, in the second year, it's it's a primary care uh, block. Uh, now, for those uh, residents who have a car, uh, we will it, it, we will send them to a primary care practice in the community. Uh, for those who don't have a car, then we'll have them uh, end up in a primary care practice. Here on our campus, um, the, um, the and the residents have uh, uh, have liked that. Uh, during the during the third year, what are these employee blocks? Well, one of them is in the uh, oncology uh, clinic. Uh, why do we do that? Because um, I think if if you don't do it, and all you do is the general medical wards, you do the ICU, and you think that patients with cancer are sick and they're dying of their cancer. But nowadays, many people are uh, not only um, surviving their cancer, but they're doing well, and they're productive members of society, and they come to clinic for routine care. So um, residents have really enjoyed uh, the oncology clinic. They see a wide breadth of different uh, kinds, kinds of cancers, more than what they see in the, in, in the, in the hospital. And, um, and they see how... Uh, the treatment of cancer is rendered because now, now most cancer treatments are ambulatory based. Uh, and, uh, patients are receiving um, their uh, infusions uh, uh, in the you know, oncology clinic. 
Uh, so a wider range of pathology. Uh, what is the second ambulatory block that occurs in the PGY3 year? Hey, that's up to you. Um, you if, if you like pulmonary, you do pulmonary clinic. Uh, if you like gastroenterology, you do GI clinic. You do nephrology, you like nephrology, you can do nephrology clinic. Um, so mm -hmm. we, we want you to have some, some direction and say in terms of what that ambulatory block looks like. Um, now, um, uh, you're going to say, well, gosh, why do you have endocrinology and rheumatology as required rotations here in the curriculum? And indeed, they are required. <clears throat> and the reason is um, because I think those two specialties are largely uh, outpatient and ambulatory in nature. If you don't do these rotations, and you just do the other rotations, like you do your your your, your uh, inpatient wards, or you do the ICU. The exposure to endocrine, the exposure to rheumatology, will not be as robust. Uh, you won't get the uh, breadth of pathology. Uh, you won't see the range of uh, treatment modalities. So I think to really get your arms around these two specialties, you really got to go to where the patients are which is in the clinic. So that's why we require these two uh, rotations. Uh, and the uh, residents have enjoyed them. They like uh, rotating an endocrine in, in room. And, uh, and some of them have chosen, based on this experience, to pursue those subspecialties as their future career choice. All right. Now, uh, what about this performance improvement block? Well, um, every resident... Every resident is required to uh, develop a performance improvement project. Uh, they uh, create the project. They work along with our uh, our quality Im improvement office, uh, who will help them with data collection, help them with uh, some of the logistics of um, uh, collecting data, uh, and uh, and and so at the end of the year, and end of the third year, uh, all the senior residents will present their performance improvement project, present their results, and it's a wonderful day. It's a day in which we can celebrate the, um, the, the wins that our residents have made in terms of improving the quality of care that we provide to our patients. Uh, and the, some of these projects have been done uh, in the hospital setting. Uh, some of them have been done in the uh, resident uh, ambulatory practice. Uh, some of them have been uh, presented at uh, national uh, meetings, um, and uh, and have won awards. Uh, so this is really a, a, a wonderful experience for our residents, but it's also wonderful uh, for our hospital and for our patients. Um, and uh, each project, uh, we as a hospital get better and better and better. Um, now, as I mentioned, neurology and cardiology are based at the downtown site. Uh, Jerry Atch was based at the VA, and um, and 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 uh, and we have neurology here. And you you might say, why don't you just have neurology here in Midtown? Well, at the downtown site, they have a neurology residency program, neurology faculty, neurology grand rounds, um, and so when our residents rotate uh, with uh, that inpatient service, uh, they get a very robust um, uh, uh, experience. Um, and they see a lot of interesting cases, cases that are referred from all over the state. Um, the, the offshoot also of having residents rotate on these rotations at the downtown site is they develop familiarity and comfort level with a downtown campus. So um, they uh, will have less hesitancy in arranging and scheduling other electives uh, downtown, um, electives like uh, rotating on the transplant service, rotating on the uh, nephrology consult service, rotating on the uh, on the ID service downtown. These are um, uh, services are available here, but at the downtown site, you'll, uh, you'll consult on a different uh, population of patients. For example, the infectious disease consult service uh, rotates through shock trauma. They rotate through um, the transplant service, so you'll see different types of infections, uh, different um, uh, patient populations, 
uh, and 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 it will, what it will do, it will round out your um, overall um, uh, ex uh, exposure uh, and experience in those specialty areas. Uh, this is the downtown Inner Harbor. Uh, you can you can park your boat here in the Inner Harbor, visit the sites. Uh, the clinic. So the clinic, you have the you have the same continuity clinic for all three years. Uh, the electronic medical record system, a little bit, uh, it's it's epic, uh, and uh, uh, you'll you'll ha you'll have access to your uh, epic chart uh, um, at home or in the hospital. Uh, now, it used to be that the residents would go to clinic one afternoon a week, every every week, and that was that was how we did it, and, uh, and that's how many hospitals uh, did it. Um, around the country. But then I'm sure you're aware um, many programs are going to an X, was, X plus Y kind of schedule. You do uh, like four weeks of wards, one month, one week of clinic, four weeks of wards, one week of clinic, That's four plus one or four plus two or six plus two or something like that. And I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you're aware of programs that do that. And so uh, we... Uh, our in, our residents were interested in this, so one of our residents took this on as a performance improvement project. Uh, she surveyed our residents about their experience in clinic when they are on the wards, and they uh, she found that when the residents go to clinic, excuse me, <clears throat> that they aren't uh, they aren't. 100% fully engaged because they're just distracted by uh, uh, by things that are going on in the inpatient side on their patients. Um, even though someone else is carrying their beeper, uh, <clears throat> sometimes they're just worried about their patients and they, they feel the pressure, the urge to, to, to get back over to the hospital. Um, so, um, so this resident um, uh, developed a hybrid X plus Y kind of schedule. No. Uh, because we're a small hospital, small program, it's very challenging to do a four plus two, four plus one, meet the needs of the inpatient side as well as the ambulatory requirements that are mandated by the ACGME. So she created a hybrid kind of schedule in which you don't go to clinic when you're on the wards or the ICU, but you go to clinic more often when you're <laughs> when you're um, uh, when you're uh, on elective or during the amptroid block, and so the total number of clinic sessions over the three years is the same, but you don't go when you're in the uh, in the wards, and uh, that was. And so she surveyed the residents after we piloted this kind of schedule. They liked it. Uh, we implemented this in July 2023. So we have um, less than half a year uh, experience with it. It seems to be going well. And the, and the residents say that now when they go to clinic, they're engaged, they're in the moment, they're focused. And they enjoy clinic. It's much more, they say clinic is more fun, more enjoyable, uh, and um, uh, uh, and it's something that they could see doing as a future career endeavor. We use the Yale Ambulatory Curriculum. Each clinic session starts off with uh, a, a half-hour didactic session where they talk about a case from the Yale Ambulatory Curriculum. Uh, after uh, three years, you'll cover a lot of the, you'll cover all the cases, and you'll get a solid grounding in ambulatory uh, medicine if you go through go through all the cases. <clears throat> all right, noon conference. By the way, if you look at this picture, you notice this resident. She's sort of um, sleeping. Yeah. Well. But um, 
I guess uh, it's that it's that uh, post prandial uh, feeling. I guess. All right. But anyway, we have a uh, we have a noon conference every day. Um, it's um, these are given by subspecialty faculty. Uh, typically, uh, cardiology has one day a month. In uh, ID has one day a month. Pulmonary, uh, I think they have two days a month. Uh, and so, uh, each uh, the days get filled up. Um, now, how does this work? Uh, we, what we've done is to take Harris's textbook of medicine, tease out all the topics, and then we assign the topics to the subspecialty director at uh, divisions and each division is supposed to cover the topics in their subspecialty area uh, in, over a year and a half. So over three years each topic is given twice. Uh, and you're not going to be able to go to every lecture. You'll be able to go to most but you won't be able to go to every lecture because you may be on night float or you may be on vacation uh, you may be uh, um, doing a rotation at the downtown campus. But um, hopefully you'll be able to get each topic at least once. So our uh, our conference are set up so that we think we cover all the topics in Harrison's at least at least once. Uh, you know, uh, um, well, uh, we'll cover it twice over three years. Hopefully you'll get a crack at each, top, each topic. Uh, emergency medicine does one conference a month. Ambulatory. So um, the residents on ambulatory block uh, do a, do they, they're, they're, they're committed to give a 30 minute talk on an ambulatory topic. And so that's once a month. M&M is twice a month. Grand Rounds is twice a month. Uh, ethics um, conference is about four or five times a year. And general club is once a month. Um, the general club is interesting. We have a general club committee, and this it's um it's is chaired by a third year resident. They decide uh, what um, what study, what trial to discuss at general club, and they also uh, create a they've created a virtual uh, newsletter, a newsletter that. Um, and so every resident has to submit a review of a clinical trial or a study to this newsletter uh, once a year. Uh, and uh, it's a way of having residents uh, be responsible for um, be, and be accountable to review a study and in some detail, uh, assess it, um, make sense of it, analyze it, summarize it, um, and uh, make sense of it. And they and it's a really nice newsletter that's uh, well received by our faculty. Faculty will mentor residents in their write ups. Uh, this is the downtown sim lab. Um, we have um, access to it. Here they are uh, in the sim lab. Uh, now the way it works is a handful of residents will go to the sim lab uh, and, and they will go there with a faculty member or a critical care fellow often as a critical care fellow and they'll most of the time they'll teach them how to do uh, various uh, procedures uh, and uh, uh, we we have a curriculum uh, utilized in the sim lab the residents uh, really like it uh, I've, we we had to stop using the sim lab during the pandemic, but now we're up and running. I was told that I was told by the director of the sim lab that our residents used it in a to a greater extent than the residents at the downtown campus. All right, we we have um, uh, this is the um, ultrasound machine on the ICU. This guy thinks he's an ultrasound machine. Um, we also have two small handheld ultrasound machines on the wards for our 
residents on the war teams. There's also one in the uh, e emergency medicine department. Um, so you can you can um, uh, you can you, can, you have access to ultrasound. Uh, we are our faculty are developing a familiarity, a comfort level with using uh, point of care ultrasound. Our emergency medicine faculty, a lot of them are uh, POCUS trained. They've done a fellowship in POCUS. And uh, at nighttime, they like teaching our residents how to use it. Um, the, um, some of our residents are, are quite adept at using it. Um, but uh, we have a curriculum, but right now, uh, the, the focus is on getting faculty trained in it so then they can teach the residents. But it turns out that the residents are so eager to, to undertake this curriculum that they've become more adept uh, at using ultrasound than the faculty. Um, uh, but um, uh, if you are interested in point of care ultrasound, I hope that you are, uh, the the um, we I hope that you may want to come and help us advance our curriculum in this area. All right. So what we're not, um, uh, we're not a fellow dominated program. We do have, as I mentioned, a pulmonary critical care fellow rotating with our residents in the ICU. Uh, but they don't. Um, uh, uh, but we don't have fellows um, on all the services. And you'll uh, find that you'll be uh, you'll be working with directly with attendings, uh, many of the consult services. You work directly, for example, with a cardiology attending, with a nephrology attending, um, and uh, and and you'll you'll get to know them well. They'll get to know you. Uh, you'll have their cell phone number. Uh, you you can uh, you can uh, email them um, EKGs to look at email them blood gases, uh, you'll find that your relationship with the faculty is uh, will be very informal, um, intimate, um, and um, and though we do have uh, a critical care fellow here, that fellow is very important uh, because um, the, in the, throughout the day, they help with procedures, they help uh, with ventilator management, they help admit um, new um, critically ill patients, and so the residents don't feel like they're left alone in the ICU. Uh, so we're, we're not a medical school. Uh, we're, the medical school is located downtown. Uh, our hospital, it, um, we have a lot of medical students here, and we have medical students here on different um, uh, departments, like uh, Department of uh, Surgery, Department of Emergency Medicine, Department of Psychiatry. Um, but... Um, uh, uh, we, we're not responsible for administering a medical school, which is which is a lot of work. But our goal is that every resident, all, the, all of you, will have one medical student to supervise and mentor each month. That each rotation, you have one student uh, to overlook to to and and because we think that helps you, that helps you become a better resident, helps you in your educational experience, and. Uh, and it makes the 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 um, environment the the atmosphere of your team uh, more academic in its approach. All right, we don't have any on-site research labs here, and that's on purpose. And we're not going to have research labs here. Those are going to be housed at the downtown site. Uh, they built this brand new uh, research building. Uh, however, our residents can go to the downtown site, get involved in bench research, get involved in clinical research, and they and they have many so far residents have done that. Uh, but um, uh, the labs themselves are not going to be based uh, here. Uh, we don't do bypass surgery here, as I mentioned. We don't do transplants. Uh, and uh, so if that's your interest, um, this probably won't be the program for you. Uh, I want to be transparent about that. Uh, oh, we don't have sub sub specialists in every field. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, so we have uh, we, we we have we have a, we have cardiologists here, but we don't have um, 
electrical physiologist. We don't have left atriumologist. Uh, we have gastroenterologist, but we don't have pancreatologist. Uh, now, now, have you said that? Um, some of these specialists can be found at the downtown site, if that's your interest. So, for example, uh, they have heart failure specialists downtown, and that's all they do is heart failure. Uh, there's electrophysiologists at the downtown site. Uh, there's uh, hepatologists at the downtown site. Uh, the, the downtown site is a big transplant center. It's a lot of liver and a lot of you know, renal transplants. <clears throat> one of the largest transplant centers in the country. Uh, so um, if um, if that's your interest, that downtown site may be a better training site for you than, than our site. For those who are interested in doing rotations, however, and just getting uh, some exposure to those sub subspecialty areas, uh, the subspecialists are, are very welcoming. All right, so what's unique? Uh, so this uh, program is, well, um, this program and the transitioning program are the only programs sponsored by the institution. The institution is very proud of these programs. Uh, they they value the programs. They want to know how things are going. Um, I meet with the president of this hospital every month, and the first question they always ask is, hey, how are the residents, how's the program doing, anything we can do to help? It's uh, they're, they're very supportive. Um, it's nice to see because that that kind of atmosphere, that kind of approach, is not universal all over the country. Uh, I I want to feel like this is a resident-run program. Uh, you, you, I it's much more fun that way. I want to feel like I'm sitting at the back of the bus, uh, and you as a uh, resident are uh, in the driver's seat. You're the one who um, uh, decides uh, what initiatives uh, to pursue, uh, which direction we're going. Um, so, for example, um, I mentioned about the simulation uh, lab. Uh, so we had a resident who was interested in simulation. Uh, he was one who created the simulation curriculum. He implemented it, and it became part of our uh, curriculum. Uh, we had two residents who were interested in point-of-care ultrasound. So they created this point-of-care ultrasound curriculum. Uh, we had to purchase the uh, handheld ultrasound devices, uh, which, by the way, each of them uh, costs more than my car, uh, but uh, I think it was a, an important purchase, um, and uh, so we 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 pursued it, and uh, now it's uh, part of our uh, curriculum. Um, so we, you know, we you as a resident, uh, you can have a say in uh, how, um, how 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 we. Uh, what we emphasize, uh, what initiatives to pursue, and for me, that's that's just makes that's much more fun. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's a um, uh, and, and for me, it makes it uh, much more a, a learning experience for me. So it's a small program, and you can make a difference here, and we want you to make a difference here. We want you to choose. Uh, we also want you uh, to. Uh, have have a say in uh, how the hospital is run. One of the requirements is that you'll be put on a committee. Everyone has to belong to a committee. And you'll see how, how the hospital is run because it's through the committee work that hospitals' policies are made. Um, and you as a member of the committee will contribute to the um, uh, editing or creation of new policies. And, and the, each of these committees... They really value the input of residents. It really makes a difference because they they know that you 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 don't have a hidden agenda. Uh, you don't have an axe to grind. Uh, you are there as an advocate for uh, the patients that you see. You're also there in the trenches every day. You see how uh, care is being rendered. Rendered. You see how care could be better, uh, and so they 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 value your insight, your suggestions, um, and. Uh, we want you to take 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 uh, take control of your of that opportunity to make a difference to our community. Um, every hospital that you visit, we want you to look at the balance between education and service, and we think that our um, hospital is balanced, our program is balanced 
on the education side. I've, I've always said that you can go to the hospital, pull out all of our residents, and our hospital would not close. Um, we have hospitalists, uh, we have uh, critical care specialists, hospital would still run. Um, our, our residents are here for an educational experience. They're not here to be service workers uh, for the hospital. Okay, all right, so what are we looking for in a candidate? All right, so by the way, so uh, this is not a resident. Right, this is not a resident. Just want to be clear about that. Okay, so what are we looking for in a candidate? Uh, so uh, I, I've gone on record as saying that you, you can probably come here, meet the requirements of the program in terms of doing the rotations, uh, doing everything that we ask you to do, probably get through, uh, not uh, break a sweat. I think it's 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 doable. It's achievable, uh, and, and we sort of do do it that way on purpose. Uh, we have we, we're looking for folks who uh, have uh, a record of demonstrating initiative, uh, intellectual curiosity, self discipline, having motivation, being resourceful, drive, uh, work as a member of a team. Um, now. Um, now you're gonna say, well, okay. So these are fairly abstract um, concepts. Um, let me, let me see if I can uh, put this, uh, give you a, uh, give you an example. All right. So, uh, so we had a we had a resident who, who came and and they, uh, they 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 rotated through the various uh, rotations and they were they landed in our ICU and they said, hey, I really love critical care. It's really, it's really cool. I really enjoy it. So they talked to the, uh, the critical care faculty, and they said, uh, "Hey, I, this is really fun. I really enjoy this. I want to, I want to explore this in more detail." So the critical care faculty member introduced them to the a um, critical care faculty member at the downtown campus, and this resident went to the downtown campus, did a rotation with him on interventional pulmonary. pulmonary and the uh, resident enjoyed that. And then the 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 the, the, the resident said, "Hey, I, I'd, I'd be interested in working on some research projects." So they um, the, that that faculty member uh, shared with him a couple of research projects they were working on. Uh, the the resident really jumped in there, uh, took a research elective to 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 hunker down and work on the, those projects. Uh, projects uh, were were reached uh, fruition. Uh, he uh, came up with two abstracts. Abstracts were submitted to Chest, and uh, and uh, he there was accepted. One was accepted as a podium presentation. The other was accepted as a poster. Uh, and, uh, and 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 that's great. They, and this resident ended up um, uh, matching in the uh, pulmonary critical care. Uh, fellowship program, and and so uh, and and that's not a uncommon story. That 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 each resident comes here. They navigate their own path. They create uh, a um, a legacy uh, that's unique to them, uh, that they're proud of, um, and um, something that. Uh, uh, that it that uh, the faculty. Uh, are are proud of as well. Now we we don't create these these paths for them. Uh, they sort of create their own, and it's through the want of their own drive, their own passion, their own motivation, their own initiative. Um, it's uh, we feel like it's our job to provide the resources, but we don't push anyone uh, to uh, achieve a goal that they have set out for themselves. All right. Um, we feel like we uh, are able to prepare you uh, for the next step, whatever it be. It could be in practice, uh, working as a hospitalist, working in general medicine. It could be uh, matching to a competitive fellowship. It could be going to uh, academic medicine. What have previous residents done? Uh, so in 2019, uh, we have uh, one person uh, went to infectious disease. Uh, one to uh, nephrology, and he is uh, now on faculty at Hopkins in nephrology. Uh, one in critical care, uh, one in uh, cardiology, 
uh, one in sleep medicine here. The Sleep Medicine Fellowship for the University of Maryland is based here. Uh, one in GI and uh, uh, one in general medicine um, in uh, California. In 2020, uh, three people went to uh, cardiology. Do we need this many cardiologists in this country? I don't know. Uh, one went to uh, Palm Crit. Uh, one did endocrinology. Two did gastroenterology. And uh, two uh, went to hospitalist medicine. Um, okay. And then in 2021, and um, one went to a cardiology, one went to a, a ID, uh, one into endocrine, uh, one to sleep, uh, one to GI, and three to primary care. And uh, I was excited about this because I'm a primary care doctor, and I think the, our country needs more primary care doctors. And uh, so this was, uh, um, this was, I thought that was, um, it was nice that people felt comfortable enough with their training in primary care, in ambulatory medicine, that they would want to pursue primary care as a future career choice. 2022, uh, one went to nephrology, one went to cardiology, uh, one endocrine, uh, one palm crit, uh, one GI, and then four went to hospitalist medicine. Uh, uh, and these, uh, uh, one of the hospitalists uh, uh, is is here at um, he he's one of our hospitalists here at uh, here at the uh, Midtown. Twenty twenty three, so the batch of this grad just graduated in June. Uh, two went to vascular medicine. Vascular medicine is this new uh, um, uh, specialty uh, with a focus on both arterial as well as venous. Um, um, uh, medicine, uh, and uh, it, it involves a fair amount of um, uh, uh, some research, um, and uh, it's a, so um, both of these very happy people. I just spoke with this, uh, with, with this person. He's going to stay on at the Cleveland Clinic, probably do cardiology fellowship there, and then uh, marry that with a vascular medicine background and, uh, and uh, pursue an academic uh, career in cardiovascular medicine. Uh, one is uh, endocrinology, uh, one did room, another did endocrine, uh, and two went, did hospitals and one did primary care. So she said that she was, she's from Korea, she wanted to return to Korea and uh, practice there for a few years and then could return to the U.S. Um, and um, uh, we, uh, she, uh, and we were, um, I think this is a, um, an interesting career destination, uh, and uh, we, I keep in touch with her and really glad that uh, she's there. She's able to be with her family, which is what she wants to do. Uh, so this is, um, over the past 10 years, uh, this is what people have done. And um, it, it seems like over the past five years, more people have gone into fellowship, less people in going to hospitalist medicine. In From 2024, 2014 to 2019, the majority of people went to hospitalist medicine. That's not by intent <clears throat> that there's been this change towards fellowship. Um, it, it just has happened that way. Uh, our goal is that you, you come here, you develop a passion, you develop an interest, and you pursue that passion. And whether it be primary care, whether it be hospitalist medicine, whether it be subspecialty medicine, that um, we want you to be successful in reaching that that goal. Okay, uh, finishing up. So Baltimore, uh, the the Inner Harbor area, as I mentioned, is a very festive area, especially in the summertime. Uh, a lot of activities. Uh, uh, it's a site for tourism. Um, the Orioles had a had a really good season. They were in the playoffs. Um, the Orioles are a baseball team. The Ravens are, are uh, a football team. Uh, we're we're about a mile away from the Orioles uh, stadium. Um, Ravens are a great team. <clears throat> oh, I hope you're not a Pittsburgh Steeler fan. That those are our rivals, and uh, we've we we we, we screen out all the Pittsburgh Steeler people. Uh, the um, this is the Baltimore Art Museum. It's about four miles up the street. Um, th 
Crab is the food of Baltimore. Um, you'll learn how to eat crabs. They're not easy. Um, it's a bit of an art. We have a simulation lab for it. Uh, we have a um, soccer team. Uh, they, they, uh, they, 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 they play the other uh, residencies in town. Um, now, does this look like a soccer team to you? These guys are supposed to be practicing. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, they do a lot of eating here. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of soccer practice. Uh, here, uh, here they are in the ICU. Um, okay, they do some things outside the hospital. Um, they, they, they go on uh, some uh, some field trips. That this does not look safe to me. Um, I, I she, she did survive, but um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure this is the best idea. But um, at any rate, uh, it worked out. Uh, this is this is our soccer team. Now, all right. I, I, I'll be, in the interest of transparency, we did not win the tournament. All right, but they they borrowed the trophy, and they took a picture with the trophy. Uh, but but I I will say we had the best T-shirts, right? Midtown United. Come on, you got that's a great that's a great shirt. Um, oh, this is the team from this past uh, just last month. Uh, September uh, we had we had the soccer tournament and uh, this is our team uh, again we didn't we didn't win but uh, uh, they did well they won the first batch and then um, it went downhill after that uh, we have a, a medical jeopardy team uh, they um, uh, we we compete against the, the team the, the other residencies in Baltimore and two years in a row, uh, we we won in uh, twenty. I guess it was 2019, 2020. and then um, uh, you go to the nationals, and uh, uh, then that that's always a lot of fun. Um, and this is our team at the. This is uh, when they won and they went to the nationals. Uh, okay, so um, Ravens are our team. Uh, whoop! Um, we've they they do a lot of activities outside the the, the hospital. Um, I don't know that um, it's necessarily uh, productive, but they do a lot of eating. Okay, so today uh, you'll have some interviews uh, with some faculty. You'll have noon conference. Um, we have a, a virtual tour video. Uh, we have these informal sessions with uh, residents. Uh, we call them happy hour. We call them happy hour because that's how we're going to get the residents to attend them. Um, and um, the, those those are very important sessions. Uh, you, you, no one from the program will be there, just the residents. Uh, the residents will not have any PowerPoint slides. They won't have any agenda. They're there as a resource for you. So we want you to use that session as an opportunity to cut open the underbelly of the program, uh, to uh, ask them any and all questions, uh, and and nothing that you say or do during those sessions will come back to the program. Uh, we, we want you to um, feel very comfortable um, with any and all questions. We want you, at the end of the day, to feel like you have a sense of what it's like to be a resident here. And that's our goal. If um, if 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 you if you can walk away and say yeah I know what it's like to be a resident there then 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 we'll feel like we've accomplished our goal our goal is not to have you leave with a true impression of what it's like to be a resident here uh, okay uh, you're gonna have a you'll meet uh, you'll have some time with uh, Shara Nolan she's the residency coordinator she'll go over the benefits and um, I will say lastly that. Routine follow-up is not encouraged. This is a rule by the by the um, by ARIS and the NRMP that uh, we don't engage a routine a routine correspondence. However, if you have a question, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we, we we we'd be glad to hear from you. Okay, so I'm going to conclude there. Apologize that it took so long, and uh, I look forward to meeting you at the time of your interview. Um, and um and 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 
and, and glad to answer uh, any questions that arose um, as a result um, or in spite of this presentation. Okay, so um, see, talk to you soon. Bye.